Hi guys, what's up? Hi. Hi. Hey, good to see you. Nice to see you guys too. Uh, actually, as far as I know, we have no time. We have two talks in one. And uh, I suggest you to start, Elizabeth. Awesome, sounds good, thank you. So yeah, let's dive in. Um, I am excited to be with you all here today, so thank you for the time. Uh, so I'll be going over three things today. Uh, first is Core Web Vitals program basics, then how to measure it, some of our tooling, as well as Lighthouse scoring. Um, the one of the things that I wanted to do is a quick shout out is that you know this talk builds on an entire team's worth of work. So I wanted to make sure that I was giving due credit to all the amazing people who uh, are working to to make this happen. So let's dive right in. With Core Web Vitals program basics, I want to go over what it is, um, why it exists, some basic methodology, and what to expect from the program. So what is Core Web Vitals? Uh, they are a set of quality dimensions, user-centric metrics, and thresholds that apply to all pages across all industry verticals and types of experiences. So they're ultimately signals to developers and business stakeholders about the basic health of your site, and they should be measured by everybody. The initiative is viewed as a holistic package of user experience quality signals that a developer needs to optimize in order to create a foundation of a healthy site. So it's valuable because it gives everybody a common place to start and it's stable. It's only updated once a year. So let's go over really quickly at a high level what the current version of Core Web Vitals is. So it's composed of three representative metrics and it's representing quality dimensions. So for instance, LCP or largest contentful paint is representing the quality dimension of loading. So as we know, there are a ton of different loading metrics, but LCP is the representative one. Then there is first input delay that's helping you to give a signal about interactivity and then CLS cumulative layout shift, which helps with measuring visual stability. So largest contentful paint, it's a measurement of perceived loading experience. Um, it marks the point during the page load when the primary or largest content element has loaded and is visible to a user within the viewport. Also, that's my dog and she's adorable. Um, LCP is an important complement to First Contentful Paint, FCP. It only captures the very beginning of the loading experience. So LCP helps for you to understand how quickly a user is actually able to see the content that you want them to see. To provide a good user experience, they, you know, we should be striving to have an LCP about, you know, within the first 2.5 seconds of the page starting to load. And to make sure that you're hitting this target for most of your users, a good threshold to measure is the 75th percentile of page loads. And that's segmented across both mobile and desktop devices. Um, and it is, uh, you're going to be seeing the 75th percentile come up uh, a few more times because we use it across the board for all core web vitals. So FID, first input delay, it measures the time from when a user first interacts with a page. So when they click, you know, tap a button, use a custom, you know, JavaScript powered control, that kind of thing, to the time when the browser is actually able to respond to that interaction. And to provide a good experience, it, folks should keep, you know, first input delay less than 100 milliseconds. Um, and we recommend this for 75% of page loads again. And given that FID can only be measured in the field with real users, we want to make sure that you have a way to actually locally debug and optimize it, uh, because that makes it harder if you can't measure it in the lab. So that's where total blocking time, or TBT, comes in. So TBT quantifies load responsiveness. It measures the total amount of time when the main thread is blocked long enough to prevent the you know, input responsiveness. So TBT measures the total amount of time between first contentful paint and time to interactive. So basically using both lab and field to measure interactivity is, is best practice. Then there is cumulative layout shift, so CLS, and that's a measurement of visual stability. It quantifies how much a page's content visually shifts around. CLS in a lab environment is measured through the end of page load, whereas in the field, you can measure CLS up to the first user interaction or including all user input. Most pages you know, need to load several elements and often these load progressively. This can be a good thing. You know, if some content appears as early as possible, that might be good. However, if the position of already visible elements shifts as others load, it can just kind of be kind of not be nice for the user. Um, fewer shifts means less chance for interruption and errors, basically. So 
The lower the CLS, the better, and we recommend a CLS of less than 0.1 for 75% of your page loads. All right, but we had a bunch of metrics before. We had quality assessment tools. Why do we need Core Web Vitals? So historically, our, as our understanding of measurement of user experience improves, we release new metrics and we update thresholds based on that understanding. But there are problems with that. So we were getting feedback. And here's some of the feedback that we got was that, you know, we would be releasing updates and changes to metrics and our tools at random t intervals, you know, unexpected changes. So, you know, you're going along trying to optimize your site, you feel like you're making good progress, and then we move the goalposts. And, and you don't know when it's coming. And that's, God, that's not good. Um, the other thing that we were hearing was inconsistent quality bars across different Google tools. Uh, so, you know, you go to one tool, it has a few metrics, you go to go to another, it doesn't have those metrics, but it has one of them, but it doesn't have the others. Why is that? Which one should I be using? So that's, that's also not good. Um, folks are often unsure where to start. They're like, okay, just give me a starting point. I realize that all of these are important, but how do I dive in? Um, what do I prioritize? Then there's too many signals to focus on. So again, um, figuring out how to kind of hone in and prioritize and then uncertainty about whether or not they applied to you. Um, so there's lot, lots of, you know, I'll, I'm a game developer or I'm developing a desktop productivity app or I'm, I'm an e-commerce site. You know, these are all very different experiences and it's important to know whether or not these metrics apply. So these you know, this feedback was why the Core Web Vitals program was created. You know, for the random timing, we have a yearly update cadence, inconsistent quality bars against Google. So we have a shared foundation for assessment across the board. Core Web Vitals is the common denominator. Then there are clear priorities. This is where you start. Limited quantity. We're not going to have, you know, 30 Core Web Vitals, right? It's going to be a smaller subset that tells you how to prioritize and get started. And it's universally applicable to all sites. So these are um, metrics that are broader than any one industry vertical um, or use case. So ultimately, we're trying to balance wanting to give you the latest in our research that we know will be impactful on your bottom line, while also not thrashing the ecosystem and injecting changes at random intervals. So that's why. As far as methodology, I want to share a few program goals. Um, some are, as I mentioned before, universally applicable. Um, the other is kind of ammo for developers with cross-functional teams is because there's consistency now and it's used by you know, Chrome, Search, et cetera, you're able to, as, as a dev, hopefully go to other cross-functional teams in business, whether it's marketing or some other teams and say, hey, here's here's how we're being evaluated. Um, and hopefully that consistency is helpful to help give a uh, kind of a more, more performance oriented culture. Then there's predictable timelines. Again, you know when the changes are happening. Um, achievable is extremely important. So the thresholds for the Core Web Vitals need to be achievable by existing web content, not some mystical, amazing content that that we're going to be able to create in 10 years, you know? So to confirm that a threshold is achievable, we require that at least 10% of origins on the web currently meet the good threshold when we're setting it. Um, additionally, to ensure that well-optimized sites are not misclassified due to variability in field data, we also verify that well-optimized content consistently meets the good threshold. So for example, while zero milliseconds is an ideal LCP, you know, good threshold, a zero millisecond threshold is not practically achievable in most cases. Um, there's network and device processing latencies that you just don't have control over. So that's why we don't set those kind of unreasonable uh, goals. And then demonstrated impact, we want uh, to make sure that you have the confidence that you are investing in something that's going to have an impact for you. So some guiding principles for the program is that you know no one metric is sufficient to fully measure any one given quality dimension. There are tons of loading metrics that range from early to late load, some that measure latency and some that measure execution activity, but we wanna pick one that is balanced given that we are trying to pick a limited number of metrics for you to prioritize if you don't have the time to tend to other ones. And you know, a good example is LCP. 
We have FCP, FMP, speed index, a long list of loading metrics, but LCP is broadly applicable, it's actionable, and it's indicative of a page being loaded enough to be useful to a user, generally speaking. We may add additional loading metrics to Core Web Vitals in the future, but we feel like LCP is a really solid place to start. So ultimately, we are wanting to give you the simplest way by which you can manage trade-offs between time investment in optimizing metrics, estimated savings, and business impact. Um, that's why we you know, want to focus on metrics that actually do have an impact on your bottom line. These are you know, properties of a good top-level metric that were created by the Chrome Speed Metrics team. Um, they're a great place to you know, understand basically the, the complexity of developing a good metric, um, something that's measurable, representative. Um, I won't go in depth here, but I highly encourage you to check out this page, given that it gives so much insight into how we think about Core Web Vitals, development of metrics in general, um, and how we think about what Web Vitals you know, kind of have what it takes to potentially graduate to being a Core Web Vital. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I really kind of wish that I could go further in because this is really interesting stuff, but I'm going to uh, leave you with the link and I will continue. As I mentioned in the earlier slides, you know, one of the things that we that we use to guide us um, when we're choosing Core Web Vitals is impact on your bottom line, uh, because we don't just want you optimizing things because um, we want to make sure that you know if you spend the time, it shows you results. But as we know, there are other dimensions of quality that are extremely important. You know, there's accessibility, security, mobile friendliness. There are a lot of dimensions that make your site even better and are important to your site's success. So don't stop measuring these if you are already. And if you aren't, then once you've optimized your core web vitals, you can begin to venture into measuring and benchmarking against other important vitals that are relevant to your business and your users. So core web vitals are just as the name indicates, they are core and they provide you a foundation upon which you can further optimize. And this can be seen by other tools and programs that showcase additional signals to focus on, focus on such as page experience and lighthouse. So like I said, a great example of other signals that are important are the ones that are being used for page experience. So you know, this page uh, past May, it was announced that page experience signals would be included in Google search ranking. These signals measure how users perceive the experience of interacting with a web page and contribute to, you know, ensure that people are getting the best experiences. Um, and Core Web Vitals can be seen as the common denominator for all tools and programs. You may see things built on top of it, depending on what tool or program you're looking at, but they all share the same foundation. Optimizing your core web vitals sets you up for success across the board. So briefly, what to expect? As I mentioned before, our ability to measure user experience is always improving. Um, so we expect to update core web vitals on an annual basis and provide you know, as many updates in, in advance about you know, future candidates, motivation, implementation status, and that kind of thing. So looking ahead towards 2021, Core Web Vitals um, will be refreshed to ensure that it reflects the latest in our learnings. And this includes adjustments to the set of metrics as well as the thresholds. So this is just the high level timeline showing you that um, every uh, May, we anticipate an announcement of the newest version of Core Web Vitals. All right, for Core Web Vitals measurement, percentiles, field and lab, and tooling. So for percentiles, this is going back to the fact that we are recommending 75th percentile across the board. You know, our primary goal is to optimize for the user and the quality of their experience. And we want to make sure that, you know, that if you are, if at least 75% of your page views to a site meet the good threshold, the site is classified as having good performance for that metric. And conversely, if at least 25% of page views meet the poor threshold, the site is classified as having poor performance. So a 75th percentile LCP of two seconds is good, while a 75th percentile LCP of five is poor. And as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to make this achievable. So at least 10% of origins currently meet the good threshold. And you know, I'm sure that many of you know the difference between field and lab data and tooling, but it is one of the um, 
I will say it is one of the biggest points of confusion, both for tooling and for Core Web Vitals program. And it, it, it makes sense, right? Like it, it's, it's, a, it's a base concept that, that we have to make sure we understand and get right. So here we have real world data for a page's first contentful paint, FCP. Because this is field data, this is recorded from real users on their real devices. Every time one of your users loads a page, it adds a single data point to this set. Because of this, a single field metric represents all of your users, thousands of data points, variable cache conditions, network, device environments, everything. And it presents a ton of variables and unknowns. And when you're trying to optimize based on data that represents so many different conditions, it's difficult to know where to start. And that's why synthetic or lab testing is so useful. So for example, when you run Lighthouse on your page and you get an FCP value, it is a single data point collected in real time for you, calibrated to represent a user in your upper percentiles. And what this allows you to do is use a single set of values as representative of your user's experience on your page so that you can dive deep and debug against that. And that's why we try to provide you ample coverage in both lab and field tools. Um, we want to give you tools that focus on what real users are actually experiencing, and that's field data. And then we have our lab tools um, to give you mechanisms to see what needs improvement before a user even sees the page with things like Lighthouse CI and giving you a reproducible environment to debug and optimize. Which brings me to tooling. And you can see that Core Web Vitals is available across the board. Um, it's uh, you're able to measure your core vitals for a specific page, for your origin, locally in the lab, and from real users in the field. And as I mentioned, you know, TBT is used as a proxy lab metric for FID. I wanted to make sure that you had all of our tools mapped in a workflow. Um, you know, which tools do what? Where do I go first? Um, I will say that a good place to start is PageSpeed Insights, um, but all of our tools have a part to play. So using Search Console, for instance, allows you to see across your entire site and identify types of pages that need improvement. Then you can diagnose and optimize with Lighthouse and DevTools, and then prevent regressions with Lighthouse CI, create a custom dashboard to monitor with Crux, and you can go to web.dev for guidance at every step. So I'll be calling out a few of these now. The first is the Crux dashboard, and it allows you to easily track your origins performance over time, and you can use it to monitor the distributions of all of your Core Web Vitals metrics. Um, we've also introduced the new Core Web Vitals landing page, so you can see things even, even more easily. Then there's the Crux API, um, and it's built you know, for simple and comprehensive access to field-based user experience data. So developers can query for an origin or URL and segment results by different form factors. The API updates daily and it summarizes the previous 28 days worth of data and that includes your Core Web Vitals performance. Then there's PageSpeed Insights and the PageSpeed Insights API. Um, they both have Lighthouse 6.0 under the hood and they support measuring Core Web Vitals in both lab and field sections of the report. So Core Web Vitals are annotated with the blue ribbon and from the Crux data set, you'll be able to see whether or not 75% of your page loads are hitting the core of vitals thresholds for each metric in your field. And you can do that for your origin as well. Then you can take a look at the lab data from Lighthouse to see whether or not you're hitting the core of vitals thresholds for each metric in a synthetic testing environment. And this helps to guide you towards actionable opportunities to improve your page's performance. So a few quick notes. Um, for field data, the x-axis represents the total number of pages that were loaded by users that month and the respective percentage of page loads in the origin that were loaded fast, average, and slow. And then the second note I want to make is on format. So the top level score gauge is based on your lab performance from Lighthouse. So the 61 that you see here, um, it's higher now, yay. Um, it is calculated by using a weighted blend of the lab performance metrics. So keep in mind also that opportunities and diagnostics are not used in the calculation of your top level score. It's just the metric scores from the lab. And so we're working right now to fix that it goes kind of lab, field, lab, um, because we know that that can cause confusion. Then there is Core Vitals report in Search Console. 
Um, it helps you to, as I said, you know, it, it helps you to identify type, like groups of pages, um, types of pages that need your attention. And this is also powered by the Chrome user experience report. Ultimately, the list of tools continues, but I want to give um, a way to think about what's going on kind of under the hood um, for any one of these tools so that you can use this to evaluate whether or not a tool is right for what you're trying to accomplish. So we see a lot of confusion stems from the fact that there are a lot of variations between tools depending on which product surface you're looking at. So there's, there's ways to kind of profile which tool um, and profile the tool that you're looking at, so to speak. Um, so the Lighthouse panel and DevTools, it's lab only. Device, you can do both mobile and desktop. It is URL only, does not have origin coverage. It is run locally, so your local hardware will affect it. It, it covers uh, additional metrics above and beyond Core Web Vitals. Um, it's on simulated slow 4G, et cetera. Um, one of the things that I will call out is that if you look at PageSpeed Insights, one of the biggest differences here is that the um, uh, you are actually running on remote servers instead of locally. So if you're running Lighthouse in a DevTools panel versus PSI, one is running on your local machine, which will be affected by your local machine and conditions, whereas with PSI, it's based on a remote server. So if you see variance in numbers, that, that can be a very good reason why. All right, in the final few minutes, let's, let's take a look at Lighthouse scoring. So for scoring curve calibration, you know, you start by actually collecting the raw performance data, and then we map it to 1 to 100. But hold on, there's actually quite a bit in that step two. So once Lighthouse is done gathering the performance metrics, they're mostly reported in milliseconds. It converts each raw metric value into a metric score from zero to 100 by looking where the metric falls on its Lighthouse scoring distribution. The scoring distribution is a log normal distribution derived from the performance metrics of real website data on, based on HTTP archive. So for example, largest contentful paint, LCP, it measures when a user perceives that the largest content of the page is visible. Um, and based on real website, data, top performing sites render LCP in about you know, 1,200 milliseconds. So that metric value is mapped to a score of 99. Going a bit deeper, the Lighthouse scoring curve model uses HTTP archive data to determine two control points that then set the shape of that log normal curve. The 25th percentile becomes a score of 50, so the median control point, and the 8th percentile becomes a score of 90, the good or green control point. While exploring the, the scoring curve, you, know, you can see that there is a near linear relationship between metric value and score. And this is, I, I will say, the, the fact that this is based on real um, a corpus of sites on the web is an important thing to call out. We aren't creating an artificial data set to base our scoring curve on. We are using the real web, um, which is basically a data set that we have that's publicly available um, of periodically crawled sites on the web and with detailed information about the fetched resources. So that, that's an important thing just methodologically to know that we are using the current state of the web um, as the foundation upon which we build our evaluation tools. So we take, we map it to the one to 100 using the scoring distribution, and then we take the weighted average of the metrics um, and then evaluate which a bucket it falls into, which then gives you the uh, green, orange, and red. I would love to have you push you to use the Lighthouse scoring calculator. Um, it gives you a comparison between different versions of Lighthouse. And when you run an audit with Lighthouse 6.0, the report comes with a link to the calculator. And this also shows the weighting that I mentioned a moment ago. So you see first contentful paint is weighted at 15%, et cetera. And so then you, hold on, then you get the score. Um, and this process is a sound methodology by which you can take a variety of different signals, each weighted differently, and turn them into a 0 to 100 score. Most recently, we've actually seen Next.js Analytics use Lighthouse's performance methodology in the calculation of their blended field score. So use, they use the same approach to calculate their scoring curves. 
And I wanted to take a moment to call out two things, and I am running out of time, so I'm going to go quickly. Um, there are two primary considerations when thinking about throttling. First is network throttling, and then there is CPU throttling. So Lighthouse uses simulated throttling by default, and it's calibrated to represent the bottom 25% of 4G connections. So this helps you to optimize for your top percentiles, which means that when you're optimizing for your Lighthouse scores, you are optimizing for the vast majority of users. This throttling approach has many advantages, but there are also variability trade-offs, and you can find out more at the links later. The second element of throttling to consider is CPU. Um, this poses challenges to variability and results across devices, um, so it's important to calibrate your device before attempting to compare reports. And then, you know, this is useful when you are you can uh, calibrate to different um, devices because you want to know, you know, what devices most of your users are on, and you can actually optimize against that. So quickly on metric composition, um, the Lighthouse score is a weighted blended combination of the user-centric metrics that you see in the report. And so this includes, you want to measure loading performance, interactivity, and, and layout stability. And, but where does Core Web Vitals come in? Well, ultimately, they're right here, right? Because Core Web Vitals represents the table stakes of a good experience, um, we have to have them included. But on a, you know, just like Core Web Vitals, we're trying to make sure that we are keeping the Lighthouse score up to date with the latest in our research. So Lighthouse 6.0, the Core Web Vitals metrics were added, and others, First Meaningful Paint, for instance, were removed. And you know, ultimately, we, we want to make sure that um, just as you saw with page experience signals, we in the Lighthouse report have additional quality signals added that tell an even more comprehensive measurement story above and behind, beyond Core Web Vitals. And so, you know, this is the current uh, Lighthouse performance score composition. The various metrics are weighted differently based on what we found to be most important for user experience. And Core Web Vitals, with one exception, are the most heavily weighted metrics in the Lighthouse performance score. So when you're optimizing for the Lighthouse score, you're setting yourself up for success with Core Web Vitals in the field. The only reason why CLS was weighted lower was it, at the time, it wasn't as mature um, when Lighthouse 6.0 was being released. So I'm out of time, folks. Um, some key takeaways, and I will tweet these links out at the at the end. Um, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Sergey, maybe you have some questions? Yes, of oh. course. Uh, firstly, uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for a part of Keynote. It was so concentrated. And in the beginning of question uh, section, I want to tell that this is my first experience as interviewer, especially this is my first experience at HolyJS. My English skills can be not so cool, but today I will be your expert. And uh, before uh, tuning to uh, our first question section, I want to ask my own question. Do you know the most dangerous phrase or maybe word in deployment? So one of the first things that comes to mind is whenever anybody says, it's done. It definitely is never ever done. <laughs> so that that's dangerous to me. When I hear that, I get scared. <laughs> For me, this phrase is a uh, oops. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's move to the questions. Uh, my first question: uh, Is there any difference in approaches? For the vitals? Uh, for improvement between small websites and the uh, large one? It, it's a good question. Same. I think. Okay. Or sorry. Oh, just answer. Oh no worries. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, Core Web Vitals is um, going to be applicable to both large and small. But then, as you start to look beyond Core Web Vitals, and you're looking to, you know, think about okay, what is going to be best for my use case, my users, my my vertical the type of experience I'm building, then you start to get a little bit more uh, nuanced with where you want to be focusing your metrics. Okay, my next question. Uh, on the other hand, the vital metrics uh, in the near future will influence on website ranking. On the other hand, the main goal of these metrics is to make user experience uh, or maybe user happy in most. So my question is, 
uh, what about cheaters? It's possible to beat the metric system and why? Yeah, so ultimately it's, um, it, a lot of the metrics are a lot easier to, uh, to get around and, and kind of cheat in the lab than they are in the field, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's one point. But at the end of the day, you're shooting yourself in the foot, right? Because you're absolutely right. You're trying to provide a good user experience, but you aren't just doing it because you're doing it because it has an impact on your business. So if you're finding some really clever way to get around and, and cheat a metric, that's fine. You look slightly better on the metric maybe. And of course we're designing it to make that as hard as possible, but say, say you, you do it, then it's going to, you're still not going to be actually optimizing for your user's experience and it's going to be affecting your business mm -hmm. poorly. So guys, guys, sorry. Uh, we, I have to interrupt you because we have no time, uh, for the questions. Maybe, uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for such a good talk. Of course. And, uh, Ivan, could you please start? Okay. Hey. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. And yeah, today I'm going to, to make a case study on improving Corbo Vitals. Um, and well, so Elizabeth told us about what Corbo Vitals mean and how they are calculated. So now let's take a look at how we can actually improve them. And to do that, let's take a look at the CNN site. So CNN is a large American media company. And for media, performance matters because the faster the site is, the better is typical of the engagement in the traffic. Like, for example, Financial Times redesigned their website in 2017 and tests showed that the new site was getting up to like 30% more engagement. Or GQ, a fashion magazine in 2015 redesigned, sorry, made their site five times faster and get 80% more traffic. And well, Numbers, 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 lots of numbers. Back to CNN. So the CNN website is surprisingly quite slow. The Latao score of a single news page is six, and concrete metrics aren't good either. The largest content full paint is 22, the total blocking time is 16, and only cumulative shifts measured in page speed insights is zero. So assuming you've got to say that it's this slow, how do you figure out why it is actually slow and how do you actually improve it? Well, let's dive in. And first, let's take a look at the largest contentful paint. As Elizabeth mentioned, the largest contentful paint is how much time it takes for the page to render the largest page element. It could be the hero image, it could be text, it could be something else. It's basically the largest element. And to analyze, largest contentful paint, I'm going to use two tools. The first tool is Chrome DevTools, obviously, and the second tool is WebPageTest. So what is WebPageTest? WebPageTest is an advanced performance analysis tool. It's available at webpagetest.org. It's free, and it traces how the page loads and gives back lots of information in an easy-to-consume shape. Yeah, it looks a bit dated and it could be a bit too advanced at, time, at times, but that's probably its only drawback and I really love it otherwise. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to use web page test to, and I'm going to show you how to use web page test to look at the loading waterfall and figure out why CNN's largest control paint is so, well, large. And so in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into web page test. I'm already here. I'm going to copy the paste. I'm going to uh, copy the uh, URL of the page that we are going to analyze and paste it here. Then I'm going to change the browser settings to Moto G4 Chrome. So one thing I love about web page tests is that it allows you to test on real mobile devices, not just not just emulated mobile like in Lighthouse, but real, cheap, slow mobile phones. And I'm also going to change the 
connection settings to 4G to make to make to make it closer to what PageSpeed Insights runs with. And I'm going to start the test. So to save time, I'm not going to take to wait until the test finishes. I already have a completed test. Um, but anyway, so I'm going to switch the test. I'm going. Uh, I, I just opened the test and. The test page has a lot of info. It could be it could be a bit of a bit overwhelming initially, but basically there are two pieces. Uh, there are two kinds of information I'm currently caring about here. And the first piece is Web Vitals. What basically inside does it measures Web Vitals right on the device we are doing the testing at. And in this case, we can see that uh, well, Web Vitals measured at this Moto G4 phone. Actually, yeah, look, not so good. And the second piece that I'm currently inter interested in is the network waterfall. Network waterfall is a waterfall of all resources that are loaded to our network, and it's located right here. It's pretty large. CNN downloads quite a lot of stuff, and I'm pretty sure most of that is third, par is third parties. That's like, it's typical third parties, and that's probably the reason why total blocking time is high. But We'll get to that. Right now we're talking about large scale complaints, so let's focus on that. Okay, cool. So we have test results. Now, how do we actually figure out what what, a, what affects a large scale complaint? How do we actually debug the large scale complaint? And there are three things I typically focus on first when I would use the large scale complaint. And it's server response time, it's surrender blocking resources, and it's a late here image. These are the three issues that, in my experience, tend to affect the largest, full, the largest contentful pain the most often. And the first issue is the server response time. If your server is slow, if your server response time is bad, if your server is taking a while to serve your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, then it's going to take a while for the browser to render your page. And so it's going to worsen your first pain time and consequently the, first, uh, the largest contentful pain time. So how do you check if this has an effect? How do you check if your server is actually slow? This is easy to do both in web page test and in Chrome Dev tools. So in web page test, you have this huge waterfall. So what you do is you click that waterfall, you wait until it loads in, in this enlarged format, in, in large shape, and you scroll down and you click on some network resources, like say the index.html response. This opens a dialogue with a detailed information with like actually one thing one thing that's great here is that lots lot a lot of information here is not present in Chrome DevTools. So if you're doing advanced network debugging, this is like super great and super convenient. But yeah, this opens the dialogue with the detailed information. And there's a lot of stuff here, but what we actually care about is the time to first byte roll. Here it is. And in this case, time to first byte measured by uh Web page test is 186 milliseconds, which is actually pretty good. And if you're using Chrome DevTools, this is easy to do as well. So what you do is you open the page, then you open the browser DevTools, you reload the page, you make sure you have the network pane open, and once resources start loading, you click on any network resource, like say again index.html, and you look at the so you switch to the timing tab, which is already open in my case. And you look at the waiting time to first byte value. And in this case, the time to first value is 40 milliseconds, which is even better than what web page test measured. This is this is really cool. So yeah, in this case, both in web page test and in Chrome DevTools, the time to first byte value is great. In my experience, like in my or in my opinion rather, I would say that any value below 300 milliseconds is pretty good. So in the CNS case, in the CNN case, the server slowness doesn't seem to be the, the issue. However, let's imagine that you do this to your site and you discover that your server response time is actually pretty bad. Like, I know, maybe it's 500 milliseconds, maybe it's 700 milliseconds. So what can you do in this case? And my go-to recommendation in this case is to employ a CDN, like Cloudflare layer or Fastly. Uh, the CDN will host your resources close to the user and will greatly reduce your server response time. And by the way, everything I'm going to mention in this talk, all the links, all the CDNs, and all the tools, 
uh, are going to be linked from this page. You could visit bit.ly slash holyperflinks and you'll find links to everything I mentioned in this tab. So a CDN works great for static resources like styles, scripts, or images, but it, it doesn't help much with dynamic resources. So if you're generating your HTML pages on the server dynamically, you'd be a bit out of luck. Those pages would still have a high, a high server response time. But if you need just a tiny bit of interactivity, like say it's only dynamic part of the page is like, the only dynamic part of the page is a footer where you have a phone number that changes depending on the visitor's country, I know, or something like that. So you could move that server logic to the CDN level as well. And that could be done with edge functions, like Cloudflare workers, like Lambda Edge, like Netlify functions, pretty much every, every CDN has them. So what you do is you part your server logic into a small function, you upload it into the CDN, and that function runs at the same servers that serve you cached files, which means it runs close to the user, and which means the server response time is small as well. So that's another thing you could do to reduce your server response time. Now, back to CNN. If it's not the server response time, then what is it? And another common offender here, another common offender with the largest control paint is render blocking resources. Render blocking resources are, well, resources that block rendering. It's all the style sheet links in head and all the script tags in head. So whenever you put a style sheet link into a head, what happens is the browser does not render any content until that style sheet done loads. Browsers do that towards showing unstyled content. Otherwise, whenever you load a page, you would see something like this before it jumps to a styled content. And Whenever you put a script tag into a head, the browser does not render anything until that script both downloads and executes. This is done mostly for historical reasons. There was a good reason to, to do this in the past, and we can't change this anymore because people expect and rely on this behavior. But yeah, well, scripts are render blocking. Scripts in head are render blocking. So what this means is if you put a style sheet that the current page doesn't need to, to a head, it's going to delay your render. If you put a script that takes a while to download into a head, it's going to delay your render. If you put a script that downloads quickly but takes a while to execute, it is also going to delay your render. And that is going to increase your router's control paint. That's rendered working resources. So, well, let's see if that's the case with the CNN. And the simplest way to check for render blocking resources, from my experience, is to simply go to the page source copy the source, paste it somewhere, oops, wrong field, paste it somewhere, remove the document body, so I'm searching for body and I'm removing body and everything that goes after it, save it, format it slightly, it's going to take just a few seconds, and once the document is formatted, search for render blocking resources, search for style sheets and search for, for script text. And in the CNN case, if you search for style sheets, if I'm going to type rel, rel style sheet, I won't find anything. I will find nothing. That means one of two things. Either there are no external styles at all, or these external styles are inserted dynamically with the script. And for CNN, it's actually the first case. There are no external styles at all. And if you search for style, for a style, sorry, for a style tag, we would see that actually, yeah, CNN uses inline style text, which they apparently based on the date, based on the data attributes, they use styled components. And that's the way they serve all the all their styles. And this actually, this is good. They are using the critical CSS approach. There are no render blocking style sheets. There are only certain styles that are needed for the current page. The same approach works for scripts. So if you search for scripts, You'll find that there are 13 scripts on the in the head, 13 matches. And all of the scripts in this case, in this case, are render blocking. So a script could be not render blocking if it has a defer or an async attribute, but there are no async or defer scripts in this case. So all scripts are render blocking. Most of these scripts are in line, like 10 of these scripts are in line, but inline scripts are also under blocking because they don't they don't they take time to download, but they still take time to execute. And 
Well, three of these scripts are external, so they take time both to download and execute. And it's the header bundle, it's the CNN header second react bundle, and it's an optimized LJ script. So we have 13 render blocking scripts, which three need to download. Now let's see if they actually affect our rendering time, like maybe they are fast and expensive and we don't need to do anything with them, right? So to see whether downloading, so we need to check for two things, whether downloading can be bottleneck and whether execution might be bottleneck. So to see whether downloading may be bottleneck, I'm going to go to web page test again. And if I open the waterfall, Right here, I could see these three network requests. I could see the network requests for these three scripts right here. Here they are. This is the second request. It's for header bundle JS. This is the third request. It's for header second react in JS. And it's the third request, the third script for the optimizable JS. And right here, right in the network waterfall in web page test, I could see the time the scripts took to, took to download. So right to the right through the rectangle that signifies when, 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 the, when the resource was downloading. Web page test shows the time it took for the script to download. So we can see that the first script took 400 milliseconds to download, the second script took 1400 milliseconds to download, the third script took 1200 milliseconds to download. Now, I don't know whether that's a lot because we're using a 4G network and a pretty cheap phone. So I, I can't, I don't know whether that's a lot or not a lot, but that's one thing to keep in mind. If, this, if these scripts were smaller, if these scripts were downloading faster, largest config plane would also be higher. Now, so that's for loading. Now to see whether execution might be bottleneck, I would need to do a performance trace of the page loading. So I would need to profile page loading in Chrome DevTools. So in order to do that, I'm going to go to Chrome again, open DevTools, navigate to about blank, this way, we won't have any like Romanian JavaScript or networking activity when we start the network audit. Um, then I'm going to press record. I'm going to switch to the performance tab. I'm going to press record. And I'm going to paste the article URL. And it's wait a bit. So yeah, we've actually got, got our first render, so we don't need to wait for longer. So once Chrome loads the performance trace, we, once Chrome loads the performance trace, we can easily see the moment of the first paint. Here it is. It's like heavily highlighted along with the first counterful paint, with the largest counterful paint, with layout shift and other web vitals, with total blocking time as well. So now if we zoom into the area before the first paint, we'll see a bunch of JavaScript rectangles called evaluate script. So here's the evaluate script. Here's another evaluate script, here's another evaluate script, and so on. And each of these rectangles corresponds to a single script that we have in head, a single render blocking script. So each of these evaluate script rectangles is render blocking. And the larger the rectangle, the longer it takes for the script to execute. And the, for, for the longer it, it blocks the page rendering. So now we can look at the largest rectangles to figure out what scripts are execution bottleneck. And in order to do that, I'm going to click through each of these three large rectangles, three large evaluate script blocks, and see the script name. So the first script is the header that bundle.js. It's actually the first external script that we were downloading over the network. It's not an inline script. The second script is CNN header second react min.js. It's as well the second external script that we are downloading over the network. And the third script is an optimized JS script. Again, the third script that we are downloading over the network. So, okay, now, now we know that we have three scripts that take a while both to download and to execute, and they are the largest confu plane bottlenecks. So what would be my advice here? We don't have, unfortunately, we don't have time to dig into the bundled contents. So I can't say what exactly is taking so much time to download and execute. However, if I were to recommend something right now, I would suggest the following optimizations. First, use get splitting. It's my favorite optimization for JavaScript. It makes your bundle both smaller in terms of bytes and faster in terms of the code that you don't execute. And if you don't know how to do get splitting, there's a short guide at WebDev, and you can find more in the web. And 
Again, there are more links at bit.ly slash holyperf links. You, you should do, secondly, you should do a bundle audit to remove what's not needed. Run a Webpack bundle analyzer, look into the report and remove polyfills or library duplicates or a huge JSON blob, which sometimes get accidentally bundled from uh, some dependencies. Even if, it, even if the code doesn't execute, it still takes time to download, parse it, and compile, and it still increases your largest kind of full paint. I have a Twitter thread with more details on how to do that. You can find it, again, in the list of links. Of course, make sure you defer scripts, you defer non-critical scripts with async or defer attributes. If you have script in head, and you add a defer attribute to that script, the script won't be blocked anymore. Use critical CSS. This is the approach that CNN uses. And with critical CSS, what critical CSS does is like it lets you serve only styles that the current page needs. So not not the not the style sheet or source for the file pay, for the file app, but only the styles that the current page needs. And this means your style sheets are smaller and the largest control paint happens faster. And if you're using the React and aesthetic site, drop React from the client site. Use it only on the server. Keep like keep rendering, keep rendering your React pages on the server, but don't serve React on the client. And I use that approach on there. There are, there are a bunch of tools that help with this. Um, and I use this approach on threepub.com. I had minor interactivity with inline script tags, and it works actually nicely. And it's actually super convenient. So I'm using React on the server, but I'm not using it on the client. Or if you have a dynamic site where you can't drop React, try try replacing React with Preact. It's React is so much smaller and it, it's, it works faster in some cases. So next, the search common offender of the largest conflict paint time is a late hero image. What does it mean? So this is a hero image. It's the largest visual, the largest page element. Largest conflict paint by definition is the moment the largest page element gets rendered. So if you have a hero image and it's late, as seen, it's slow, it's slow, it's, it renders after everything else gets rendered. Then largest conflict paint is going to be delayed. So now, how do I learn if CNN experiences this issue? How do I learn if they like if their hero image is late? I can do this in WebPage test as well. So to do this, I'm going to get back to WebPage test, scroll all the way to the end of the waterfall. The waterfall is long, so this is going to take some time. And once once I scroll to the end. Click the film strip link. The film strip link opens the film strip view. The film strip view shows the screenshots of how the page was loaded over time. A bunch of screenshots matched with the loading waterfall. So, and in the screenshots, we can see that the CNN's hero image actually loads pretty late. So the page starts rendering at 4.5 seconds, right? The first paint happens at 4.5 seconds. But the hero image is not visible up until eight seconds. And this delays the largest control paint. How can this be solved? There are a few tricks to try here. First, obviously, make sure you do all the typical stuff, like compress your images, like serve with B versions of these images, like generate different images for different resolutions. This all used to be a long and annoying process in the past, but now, thankfully, we, there are lots of tools that could do this for you automatically. And again, you can find links to them at the channel links link. <laughs> Second, consider trying out the AVIF image format. It's a new format that does lossy image compression really well. It just landed in Chrome 85 on desktop and support another browser is already being worked on. And like WebP, this image format was adapted from a video format called EV1. And it's really, really interesting in terms of the compression it does. Third, consider using progressive JPEG. JPEG is sold and it doesn't compress very well, but one feature it has, and with P or IV font, is progressive loading. Progressive loading basically means that instead of loading the image from top to bottom, like on the left, the image loads pixelated, like on the right, and slowly gets less and less pixelated. And what this means in practice is that the image gets mostly visible way before it's finally loaded. And this may improve your largest control paint. Like in this tweet of Harry Roberts, which reads, fascinating issue on a current client site where we reduced this, their main must head image weight by over 20% by switching it to WebP. But the image is now rendering almost two times later because WebP doesn't offer progressive rendering like the previous JPEG did. 
So that's one case when progressive JPEG actually wins. And last, ensure that you are not lazy loading or dynamically loading your image. This is actually a common mistake with, for example, Gatsby image. So if you're using Gatsby, you're likely using Gatsby image as well. And Gatsby image is a Gatsby package that wraps around the native browser image and generates a bunch of markup for loading images a little bit more progressively. But what it, what it also does is it, by default, uses lazy loading which means the markup it generates and the JS code it runs assumes that by default, unless you, unless you tell it otherwise, assumes that the image is non-critical and can, and can be loaded lazily. Whereas the hero image is actually critical, it can't be loaded lazily, it needs to be loaded urgently. So these settings worsen our large scanful paint. And this is actually also something CNN does, although a bit in a different form. What they do is they use a JavaScript image loader. So if you go to the source code of the page and you search for image or image text, you will see that images are C. So you, you, would scroll, you would scroll all the way down till the end of the image tag. So you will see that when you scroll to the SRC attribute, you would see that the SRC attribute defaults to an empty one pixel transparent GIF. And the actual URL, the actual image URL is encoded in data attributes like data SRC large or data SRC medium or etc. So I'm not sure why CNN does that. I guess they have a good reason for this. But performance wise, this means that the image is discovered and unloaded very, very late, only, only after the JavaScript runs and only after the JavaScript code that's responsible for these images replaces the SRC, the SRC attribute with an actual URL. And actually, if you get back to the web page test, and if you get back to the waterfall, and look at the waterfall, you would notice that the image appears that in the waterfall, the image, the hero image that we like really care about, it's really critical for our large scanful paint. You would notice that the image appears at the request number 68, which is really late. And it doesn't start loading up until the 7.3 seconds. So it takes, it takes the browser 7.3 seconds to discover this critical hero image. And furthermore, if you scroll even higher and look at the largest control paint, you'll notice that the largest control paint is 7.7 .7 seconds. So the image starts loading at 7.3 seconds. And the largest control paint happens at 7.7 .7 seconds. What a, what a coincidence. Obviously not a coincidence because like, large, the image is what, what is blocking the largest control paint here. So in the CNN's case, simply making that image discoverable earlier is going to improve large control paint possibly a lot. So they can do this by setting the SRC attribute to the actual image URL and using responsive images instead of the dynamic JavaScript image loading. Or they can, they can add a link rel preload tackle, though this is more of a hack. But anyway, this is a huge low hanging fruit. So this is large scanful paint. There's so much more that could be talked about here. But the most common issue, the most significant optimizations I typically try out first to improve the large scanful point are these. It's the server response time, it's render blocking resources, and it's a late hero image. Next, let's talk about how the second, about the second core of vital, which is the first input delay. Or in this case, because we are working with Lighthouse, because we are working with library measurements, and first input delay can't be emulated in Lighthouse, I'm going to talk about its counterpart, total blocking time. So let's take a look at CNN's total blocking time. Web page tests measure total blocking time as more than 12 seconds, with more than here meaning that it simply gave up measuring, which is actually pretty explainable. If you scroll all the way down to the end of the waterfall chart, all the way down again, you would see a section called the browser main thread. So this section shows when the browser is busy with the JavaScript, which is yellow, or layout and work, which is violet. And in this case, during the whole trace, the primary thread stays super busy with JavaScript. So the, the, recording, the recording lasts for 33 seconds or 34 seconds, the whole time the main thread is busy with JavaScript. Okay, so what do we do to improve our total blocking time in a case like this one? 
So total blocking time is affected is generally affected by two things. It's first party code, which is the code of our app, and it's a third party code, which is analytics, ads, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And now I'm not going to share to make a pretty uncomfortable observation. From my experience with React-based apps and sites, third-party code is frequently responsible for as much as half of the total JavaScript cost. This means that we, as engineers, can only get so far by improving our first-party code. If we want to actually reduce our JavaScript costs, our total blocking time, we have to reduce the third-party code as well. We have to go and talk to marketing, the, the, the teams that control the, the third-party code. And this is not what we as engineers are used to doing. This, is, this doesn't feel pleasant, this doesn't bring joy. But if we want to improve our total blocking time, we have to do this. And Harry Roberts has a great talk about the way we as engineers can talk about this with marketing. The important thing, the most important takeaway is to make sure we don't attack marketing, don't make them feel like they're the guilty people because analytics and ads actually also serve an important business role. And well, if you are going to optimize your third parties, I'm totally recommending you to watch this talk. Okay, so how do we measure how much JS, J JavaScript code third parties actually contribute? I have a favorite trick for this, and by the way, I learned this trick from the same Harry Roberts talk. And the trick, the trick looks as follows. First, we do a web page test or on over the page we want to analyze. We already have this, all right? Then what we do is we scroll to the top of the test Find the request map link. Here it is. It's right on top of the page. And click the link. The link, the link opens a page with a map of all the requests the current page makes. But this is not what we are currently interested in. So what we do is we look at the bottom of the page, find the miss the old request map link, and click that link. So this link, once it loads, brings us to a domain map. It's like a request map, but for domains. It's a map of all domains the current page requests. So what we are doing next is we are clicking download CSV data, and we open the downloaded file. And once, once Excel loads, we have a list of all our first party and third party domains. This is cool. So, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy all the third-party domains and run a test with all these third-party domains blocked. And by doing that, I'm, I, I would say an estimate of how much third parties affect the, affect the page loading. So to do that, I am removing a few first-party domains, the only few domains that are present here. It's this, and I think that's it. Then I'm copying the full list of third-party domains and pasting it into a text editor. I failed again. Um, then I'm removing all the empty lines. And I'm removing, I'm replacing line breaks, like spaces. So what I get in the end is a space separated list of all the third party domains. So what I do now is I copy that list of domains. I already did that. I go back to the web page tests page. I click home to get back to, to, to make a new test. And I switch to the block tab in advanced settings. And in this field called block domains, I am pasting that list of third party domains. And I'm also pasting the same page URL and click and start test again. Awesome. So again, I'm not going to wait for the, for the end of the test. Um, I already have a completed test with uh, the same, pardon, just searching for the link. <laughs> yeah, here it is. Uh, the completed test with the same setting. So, what this is going to do is this, this test, this test we've just launched, is going to run a performance trace of the CNN website with all the third parties blocked. And once the test finishes, which, yeah, which I have, I have the finished test here, you can see the total blocking time without third parties. And in this case, 
the total working time with the other parties is two seconds, which is compared to 12 plus seconds in the run with third parties is pretty incredible. And well, this is why the first item you, you need to tackle when you want to optimize your total working time is third parties. So for CNN, that's pretty much it. Third parties are the hugest long-hanging fruit. So that's the thing I would focus on if I was optimizing them. And to do that, watch this Harry Orbitz talk I've already mentioned, and check out the list of tricks I've collected on Twitter, tricks for optimizing third parties, delaying, delaying them, et cetera, et cetera. However, so that's it for CNN. However, for other kinds of sites where third parties are less significant, another, and this time first party problem I've frequently seen, is React hydration time. And hydration is expensive. When you have an app or a site that's written in React and that uses server-side rendering, once the page gets downloaded, it gets through hydration. During hydration, React gets through the whole server-rendered markup. It sends up event listeners. And yeah, from my experience, this is typical the most or one of the most expensive operations during the page loading, depending on the number and the kind of components it could reach from, from 100 to 300 or in 500 milliseconds. And it's another thing that contributes to your total blocking time. So, well, there are, there are a few ways to optimize hydration. First, and we've already been here, you can avoid loading React at all. If your site is static with minimal interactivity, you can keep using React on the server and do client-side interactivity with inline scripts. And if you're, use, if you're using something like Gatsby, this will do wonders for total blocking time. Gatsby plugin in JavaScript and Gatsby plugin in JavaScript tools might be of use here. Second, you can try doing partial hydration. Partial hydration is when instead of hydrating the whole page, which is costly, you're only hydrating some parts of the page that actually need interactivity. Like in this case, for example, it's the header and the after block. And partial hydration is not something that's officially supported in React. And it's not a super popular approach yet, but there are some libraries that implement it and let you use it out of the box. So again, there's so much more that we could talk about here with total blocking time, especially in regards to first party code. But summing up, total blocking time is affected by third party JS and third party JS. And we can certainly optimize first party JS a lot by reducing the hydration time and by the React or other framework performance tricks if you're using other frameworks I didn't have time to talk about here. And while third party JS isn't something we own, there are also multiple optimizations that we can do in that area. So that's total blocking time. And finally, the third core vital which we talk about today is cumulatively achieved. So let's look at the CNN audit again. The CNN audit, if we go back to the list of all tests, um, Right, sorry, that's the wrong, that's the wrong one. <laughs> that's the wrong test. If you go back to, to the list of all tests, um, the cumulative layout shift has like is higher than zero. In this case, it's 0 0.38. So what's interesting is that during some loads, cumulative layout shift is actually zero. So if you go to the first run, so what web page test does by default is it does three runs or the same page and presents the results from three runs. So if we, from three runs. So if we go to the first run, you would see that cumulative layout shift here is zero. But for the second run and for the third run, cumulative layout shift is higher than zero. So to detect what's causing this layout shift, well, I'm going to use web page test again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open run three, which is where, where this cumulative layout shift was detected. Oops, I am opening it. I'm going to open it, open the waterfall, wait until the waterfall loads, scroll all the way to the end of the waterfall again, scrolling, 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 click the film strip view, and get a film strip. And again, the film strip view, we've already been here, the film strip view shows the progress of how the page was loading over time, matched with the loading waterfall. And so to find the layout shift, I'm going to scroll all the way to the right of the film strip until I see layout shift. So no layout shift, nothing is shifting, Still nothing is shifting. Still nothing is shifting. Oh, okay. Something's interesting. And yeah, here it is. 
Awesome, you see it, right? So we had some content on top of the page. We had this header, like Johnson has mismanaged, blah, blah, blah. And then the video started loading, start loading 30.5 30, seconds. And once the video loaded, it booked some space for it and it shifted the content down. And this is the layout shift. So unlike most of the previous cases, this is less of an engineering problem and more of the design one. So this kind of layout shift most frequently happens with some ads, or in this case, videos that load after the page was loaded. Um, so, they, so they show on top of the page and shift the content down and how this can be fixed. The case, so yeah, this case is a design issue. So first and foremost, talk with your designer, talk with your designer. And second, there are actually lots of design ways to fix this. Like you could move this block down to the other part of the screen and position fixes so that it overlays the content but doesn't shift it. Or you can convert this block into an overlay toast or you could simply embed it into a specific place in the page. There are lots of solutions. So that's one issue with cumulative layout shift. Another common issue that could incur cumulative layout shift, and this time a technical one, is when you have a hero image without a width and a height. So what happens then is before the image is loaded, it occupies zero space. But when the image starts loading, the browser learns the image dimensions and reserves the space for it. This shifts the content down and causes the layout shift. The solution for this issue, the easy solution for this issue, was introduced the last year. And the solution is that now you should always set your images width and height attributes. So previously, if you had width or height set in CSS, like a GIF you were doing in responsive images, browsers were ignoring your width and height attributes and were reserving zero space for the image. So this made this means it was pretty meaningless to set these attributes. However, a year ago this changed and browsers started taking width and height attributes into account even when these attributes are overwritten with CSS. So now if you, if you have the CSS code that's already, that overwrites your width and height attributes, but you also have an image tag with widths and heights set in HTML, the browser is going to use the info to calculate the aspect ratio, ratio of the image and to reserve the appropriate amount of space for the image straight ahead. So um, Smashing Magazine has a great article about this. And well, what this change means is that if you set widths and height attributes, image loading now looks like this and does not cause a layout shift. And well, that's cumulative layout shift. Once again, the two most common offenders here are an advertisement or a video on top of the page that shifts the content down, and an image, a hero image that doesn't have dimension set. And well, that's it for me. Here's one again, a page with all the links from this talk, with tools, with articles, etc., etc., etc. And it's Rosiwana Kulov. I'm a Google developer expert and founder at thirdpower.com. We help companies to improve their performance and earn more. And well, thank you for coming to this talk. Again, my, my Twitter and links. Thanks. Thanks, Ivan. Nice talk. Thank, thank you, Ivan, for the practical part of Keynote. Uh, there were so many um, solutions Thanks for having possible me. performance problem. And now but, it's time uh, for guys, take guys, a guys, punch. Sorry, okay. I have to interrupt you again. Uh, I think we have no time for this question, but no we have time. a discussion zone. And we can go uh, to the discussion zone and uh, discuss this question. I know okay. we have questions from our visitor, and we can answer it here. Thank you, okay. guys. Uh, Elizabeth, Ivan, it was amazing. See you in a bit. See you. See you. And bye. Thank, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having bye. me. Yeah. Yeah. See you. Bye.